Sun is the star that is closest to Earth. Inside the Sun's enormous plasma ball, thermonuclear reactions take place. It is about 150 million kilometers away from us. A typical G-class star in the middle of its life cycle is our luminary. Its surface has a Kelvin temperature of 5,780. This causes its radiation to have an almost white spectrum. When its rays penetrate the atmosphere of the Earth, a yellowish hue appears. The universe's distribution of luminaries of various sizes is not even. As a result, the Sun is actually larger than 90% of the nearby stars. It also serves as a baseline for us. By watching it, we may determine the nature of other comparable objects. The Sun is where the element helium gets its name. The lines of radiation from an unidentified element were seen when scientists initially sought to deduce the chemical makeup of our star from its spectrum. It was given the name Helios in honor of the Greek sun god since for a while it was thought to be present exclusively there. Later, this chemical was also discovered on Earth, but the name remained. About one-fourth of the sun is made of helium. The remaining heavier elements make up the remaining 73%. Our luminary generates energy as a result of the thermonuclear reaction that changes hydrogen into helium. The sun's mass exceeds that of all the planets in its solar system by a factor of 500. The mass of the solar system is made up 99.86% by the sun. This indicates that it is 500 times heavier than the combined weight of all the planets and asteroids. Even Jupiter's mass is merely a thousandth of the mass of our star. The Earth is approximately 333 million times lighter than the Sun. Our star's interior might accommodate 1.3 million terrestrial planets. The density of our star is also roughly 40% more than that of water. The Sun is crowned. The crown-shaped solar corona is our star's outermost layer. Protuberances and different plasma outbursts make up this structure. These structures typically span hundreds of thousands of kilometers, or more than the distance between the Earth and the Moon. One of the hottest places on Earth is the solar corona. It is between 1 and 2 million degrees Kelvin on average. It does, however, occasionally include much hotter regions with temperatures up to 20 million Kelvin. Observing our star during its total eclipse allows one to glimpse the solar corona from the surface of the planet. The Sun has blemishes. The photosphere is the part of the sun's surface that radiates visible light. There are darker, colder places. Large groupings of spots are visible if you employ dark filters, which is not possible if you are just looking at our luminary through a telescope. Sunspots are regions on the sun's surface where the magnetic field's lines of force are bent and ripped. As a result, strong plasma discharges known as solar flares happen in these regions. The Solar Orbiter device was launched in order to research these processes. Magnetic storms may be triggered by solar wind on Earth. The solar wind is an ongoing acceleration of charged particles caused by the magnetic field of the Sun typically, its power is insufficient to cause harm to Earthlings. However, a lot of charged particles can be released during solar flares. Large chunks of plasma have even been known to separate from our star on occasion. Coronary ejection is the term for this phenomena. Such particles or plasma interact with our planet's magnetic field and atmosphere when they arrive there. There is a magnetic storm, which can cause auroras borealis to appear. Such storms can put those with chronic illnesses at risk and result in radio and electrical equipment failing. Periodically, the sun's activity varies. There is no way to predict when any of the spots that are now on the sun's surface will erupt, which is how sun flares develop. Perhaps there is a mechanism at work here that we are not yet aware of. But there is a definite rhythm that affects the overall amount of locations. There are predictable 11-year cycles with one maximum and one minimum in each. Since the start of our luminary observations, it has now been 25 cycles. 2025 will mark the next peak in its activities. The origin of this periodicity and whether the duration of variations varies throughout time are unknown to scientists. Complete solar eclipses won't always happen. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon lies between the Earth and the sun and completely or partially blocks the sun from view over a portion of our planet. 
Our satellite's orbit is inclined with respect to the ecliptic plane, therefore it occurs two to five times a year rather than once every 29 to 30 days, the length of a full lunar cycle. When the moon totally blocks out the sun, we get a total eclipse of the sun additionally, there are annular and partial eclipses. These latter phenomena are visible when our natural satellite is far from Earth and when its disk is too tiny to completely encircle the sun. Total solar eclipses will cease to happen in roughly 600 million years. The moon will steadily recede from us until it is always visible as being smaller than the sun. Only annular and partial eclipses will then be visible. The Earth is further from the sun in the summer than in the winter. The orbit of the Earth around the sun is elliptical. In other words, the distance to it changes over the year. The axis inclination to the ecliptic, rather than this fact, is what determines when it is winter and summer. As a result, when summer arrives in the northern hemisphere, winter does likewise in the southern hemisphere. In January, in the heart of winter in the northern hemisphere, the Earth passes the perihelion, the point in its orbit where it is closest to the sun. And it does so in the northern summer, when it is closest to the aphelion. The latter will take place on July 4th this year. The sun produces more than just visible light. The sun, like all stars, produces a variety of electromagnetic radiation. Our eyes can only discern the limited portion of colors from 380 nanometers, purple, to 740 nanometers, red. You first reach the range of infrared radiation if you continue to increase the wavelength and then you reach radio waves. The wavelength drops in three stages, ultraviolet light, followed by X-rays, and ultimately gamma radiation, the majority of which is absorbed by the atmosphere and the remainder of which gives us a tan. The sun emits these frequencies at a range of intensities. Additionally, some invisible spectral regions can teach us more about our luminary than visible light does. As a result, many of the space and terrestrial instruments that observe our star do so in colors that are beyond the range of the human eye. Radiation from the sun is increasing. Our star's radiation output is gradually getting stronger. It was around 25% brighter when it was born 4.5 billion years ago than it is now. Since then, it has steadily become more light. As of right moment, we don't know enough to say how these changes will alter the greenhouse effect. The possibility exists that the increasing brightness of the sun will make life on Earth impossible in 1 billion years. According to other studies, this will occur in 3.5 billion years. There will be a red enormous sun. The sun's core will begin losing hydrogen when it is 10.9 billion years old. In a few hundred million years, our star will grow and become a subgiant, an orange star with a radius 2.3 times that of the sun. The sun will start growing considerably more around the age of 12.2 billion years when a thermonuclear reaction starts in its outer layers. The inner planets will be absorbed by our luminary when it evolves into a red giant. As a result of these changes, the red giant's inner layers will eventually become a white dwarf and its outer layers will shoot into space. That was for today, thank you for staying with us, don't forget to like our video and subscribe to our channel.